I go to for guidance? I've got a good boss um, who I can get career advice from. When I need guidance, I go to somebody I love and trust. Because I don't know all the answers, so yeah, it's always good to go somewhere else. I don't think I have anybody like right now that I get guidance from. You have to look for it within yourself, because if you're looking for it in other people, you will never learn on your own. I seek counsel with my friends. If it's something that I really want to do, then if there is more cons and pros, I'll still do it anyway. <laughs> Somebody who knows more than me. Particularly my dad when it comes to girls. Uh, probably my dad, but I don't always take everything he says too literal. I always go to my friend whenever I need guidance or help or anything, because he's really smart and most importantly, he doesn't judge. I want to say thank you so much for coming this morning and also to take this opportunity to appreciate my senior pastor, Pastor Chris and Lisa, and the pastoral team here at New Life Church for the honor that they always give me to come here and minister the word of God. I minister continuously in our community center in Cosmo City, but I find it quite amazing every time that Pastor Chris asks me to come here, to come and minister the word. What a privilege, what an honor. And so I want to say thank you to my senior pastor. I want us to bow our heads as we pray this morning for the word. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for your word that will not return void. You say the grass wither and the flower fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. I thank you for this year, this entire year, up to this hour, that you've been with us. Your grace has been sufficient. You've guided us, you've led us, you've been with us by your Holy Spirit, your word that has been spoken and declared upon us. And we just come this morning to say thank you and to appreciate every little thing that you've done. As we celebrate this season of Christmas, I pray, Lord, that you will continue to speak to our hearts, to be open to those who are in need, to see the need in everyone, and, Lord, to just appreciate the gift of life that you've given to everyone today. Prepare our hearts, Lord, for the word that we are about to receive. I thank you for revelation knowledge. Holy Spirit, you are the one that speaks through us, our counselor and our teacher. And I thank you, Lord, that you use me as a, the pen, the tongue of a ready writer. In the name of Jesus, we prayed. Amen. As we saw there this morning, I'm going to be speaking to you on God's promise about guidance. When we were born in our world, in our home, we grew up and our parents were able to teach us certain things. They guided us and they inculcated into us what is right and what is wrong. We left home, we went to school, we met our teachers, and our teachers always tried to distinguish between what is right and wrong. They guided us because they had a purpose in mind. There was a design, there was a reason why they told us the things that they told us so that we come out successful in life. Every single one of us, when we are guided and we follow those, that guidance, it always brings success in our life. If we follow that, that guidance that is given to us, it takes us to the right path. But if we ignore that, sometimes it can lead to the, to the wrong path and you see people who fall on the wayside. And so this morning I want to talk about how God guides us, God guides you and guides me. Many of us are familiar with the acronym GPS. A GPS stands for Global Positioning System. A GPS is a, a little device, a unit that receives signals from a satellite and is able to uh, determine a specific location. Today, we have GPS in our cell phones. We use that cell phone. We just, we just immediately uh, put the coordinates of where we want to go and a GPS is able to take us to our destination. Also, depending on the kind of a unit that you have, your GPS can pinpoint precisely the position that you are in three dimensions, the latitude, the longitude, and the altitude of where you are. And many of our handheld devices, those GPS units that we have, come with roadmaps and pre-installed applications that are there to guide us as we, we drive along. Now, I, I must be honest to, to say to you this morning that I'm that kind of a person. If I know an area, I, I don't like to get direction. I just like to drive my way. But when, I, when it comes to an area that I don't know where, where, an area that I'm not familiar with, guess what? I see it so fashionable to immediately use my GPS because I know I can put the location and that GPS is going to take me precisely to where I want to go. 
And I discovered that every single time when I make a mistake, I go the wrong way, the GPS just keeps rerouting itself. It just reroutes and finds a different route until it takes me to where I want to go. Now, the wonderful thing about the GPS is that it is infinitely patient. It's very patient with us. Hello? Some of us, we, we, we will ignore the GPS. Especially a particular voice that you don't like to listen to. And, and so the GPS tells you to take right. You say, but I know this, I'm going to turn left. And, and so the GPS is infinitely patient. The one thing about it is that it tells you about the dangers that, you, that it foresees. Because the GPS has a, a determinant. You can see there's a roadblock ahead. And then it tells you to avoid that roadblock. Or it tells you, pre, preempts you of what is happening ahead. You're driving at 120 at a road, a, a road that is destined for 80 kilometers, and you say, slow down. Now, you can ignore that. You, you can say, you know what, I'm just going to go my way. But if you follow what the GPS tells you, it generally usually will take you to your destination without any problem. It will take you to where you want to go. This analogy can be compared to God, our Father, who loves us so passionately, who is interested in wanting to guide us through a trusted relationship that we have with him so that the final outcome will be what God wants for our life. Can somebody say amen? And so God is interested in wanting to guide us. He wants to see us succeed. He wants us to get to our destination. And for you and me to follow, to get to our destination, there are certain things that we need to do so that God is able to guide us to that destination. Psalms 32, verse 8. It says, I will instruct you and I will teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eyes. This is God speaking to us through the psalmist. God says, I will instruct you. I will teach you. There is a, a roadmap that I have for your life. And I want you to get to that door. I want you to get to the destination. I want you to, 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 to avoid all the loops or holes and all the problems that you are going to encounter. So follow my guidance. You, you know, there are some of us here this, this morning who we wish that, or we, we live in a regret because we wish we had somebody to guide us to go through certain things. That today we find and we look at our life and we regret. Maybe you sitting here right now and you feel like, I wish somebody had told me. I wish somebody had guided me that I didn't go through this. But you see, like I said to you that God always rewrote the road, the road map. He always designed. He gives us a second chance. Look at the person next to you. Say, God is a God of a second chance. He is a God of a second chance because even when you've missed the track, even when you, 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 you don't go the direction that he wanted, he's going to reroute your life. That's one thing I like about God. He will reroute, he will reroute and bring us back to the particular place where he wants us to go. And so, many people ask, but if God is so interested in me, why, why doesn't God just show me the big picture? Why God doesn't just tell me how it's going to all end up? I, I would love to know how it's going to end up. The big picture. Well, the issue is, if God were to tell you what, how it's going to look like, maybe you're going to change your mind because the picture you see is not what you want. Or the picture I see is not what God, God, God I didn't expect it to be like this. And so we have a certainty that if, if, if God were to show me this picture and I don't like it, I will have to turn to the other direction. We saw Jonah. God says to Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. They are living in sin and I, want, I will destroy them if they don't change their ways. And here Nineveh, for Jonah, must stay the way it is. Jonah turns the opposite direction and runs away from God. Because God has given Jonah, he told Jonah, this is what I want. This is the outcome. And so in many of us in our lives, if God were to show us the big picture, we might just not want to follow the, the route or follow his guidance. And so what does God do? He takes time, step by step. He goes through a process with us. He says, I want you to take the first step like a little child who is learning. You fall and God says, it's okay. I want you to wait, stand up again and you take the next step. And the more you do that, the more God, you begin to build confidence in yourself. And I know there are many of us who are sitting here this morning, and we know that we are supposed to take the first step. We know we are supposed to get engaged in something. Maybe it's a business opportunity. Maybe it's that commitment. Right now, we've been in this relationship, and it's time to take the next step. 
But, but there is some resistance. There is something that is, is I, I'm not too sure. I, I don't know what to do. But God is saying, listen, if, if, you, if you follow me, if, if I'm guiding you through this process, you, the outcome is going to be wonderful. You just need to trust me. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18, this is what it says. He says, the path of the just is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter into the perfect day. He's talking about us, the just, the righteous. We are the righteousness of God. And he said that part, God has already designed it. So how does God do that? How does God guide us? And so this morning, I want us to look at the different ways that God gives us guidance. And the first one that we're going to look at this morning is that God guides us by his word. The commanding scriptures. That is the first way God guides us. Psalms 119 verse 105. It says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Wow. We were singing that song this morning as Freddie was singing about God and the light that he brings to dark places. The darkness, he shines the world. So when you take the scripture, the scriptures, when we open the scriptures, the scriptures bring light to a dark world. It reveals the things that are hidden in darkness. His word lights the path for you and I to follow. And we are able to distinguish between what is right and we're able to distinguish between what is wrong. We are able to distinguish between what is good. And we're able to distinguish between what is evil. God has trust in you and me that if we follow him, he will guide us into all truth, the Bible says. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, he says, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. Hello? Basically, if you take the word of God and you look into the word of God, you will begin to see where you've heard, where you've made mistakes, and where you are right. So these scriptures are there for you and me. And he continues, he says, it strengthens us, it strengthens us out and teaches us to do what is right. It is God's way of preparing us in every way, fully equipped for every good thing God wants us to do. So God, through his word, has given us a manual for life, a roadmap. A manual on how to live a successful life. Anything that you desire, anything that you want, you can go back to the scripture. And the word is so clear. God wants you to succeed. Anything you want to know about life is in the book. And some of us in our world today with technology, we've got our Bibles in, in, in our cell phones, in our laptops, in our Apple Mac. And we've got the word everywhere. The problem is, do we take time to go and look at what the word says? Just having a Bible is not enough. It's spending time, and we're going to get into that just now, to understand what the will of God is for my life. The will of God, if you want to find the will of God, is in the word of God. Let me say that again. The will of God is in the word of God. If you want to know what God thinks about something, well, then you need to go into the word that God has already given us. And you will find what he says in that scripture. Hebrews 4, 12 says this. He said, for the word of God is full of living power. It is sharper than the sharpest knife. Cutting, between, cutting deep into our innermost thoughts and our desires. It exposes us for what we really are. He says, nothing in all of creation can hide from him. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. This is the God to whom we must explain all that we have done. That's what he's saying. Another translation says, for the word of God is powerful and active. It pierces into the division of soul and spirit. God's word has got that ability to, 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 to bring light in places where there is darkness. It reveals our thoughts, our intentions. The word of God is so powerful. If we use the word of God as a guiding principle, we will always go right. God will never tell you to do something that contradicts what he says in his word. Never. Because he has already made his word. The Bible says he's made the word, his word above, he's elevated the, the word above his name. So the word is so important, friends. As we are coming to the end of this year and, and we're making plans because this is December, we're going to make resolutions. We're going to, 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 to say, I want to do this. Let us understand the principle that is in the word of God. Let us know that God is so keen in wanting us to understand what he is saying. 
He will never tell us to do something that contradicts his word. God will never violate his own word that he has written for you and he has written for me. Now, God will always want us to succeed. He wants us to succeed. I don't know, about the, I don't know of any parent who wants to see the children fail. But above that, God is so loving, he's so caring, he loves us so passionately. What he thinks about you and me, he say, he looks at you as the apple of his eye. God is so jealous when somebody wants to hurt his child. God has such desire to see every single one of us grow up to our full potential. Succeed in life, succeed in our marriages, succeed in our businesses, whatever we do, that is God's heart. Behold, God says, for I know the plans I have for you, plans for good. Everybody say good. Say God is a good God. Plans for good and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. That is God's heart. He's always been. And so we see in the life of Joshua now, in the case of Joshua, God gives Joshua a promise. He says to Joshua, my servant Moses is dead. Now I want you to take control. Joshua is going to step into some new shoes. He's going to step into some, I mean, these are, these are, this is a, a position that he's never been in before. It's a tough position. But God assures Joshua, he said, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I'm not going to leave you alone, Joshua. Don't be afraid. And this is what I want you to do, Joshua. I want to guide you. Moses has done the first part. Moses took the children of Israel out of Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, and now I want you to continue what Moses has done to take them into the promised land. It's not going to be easy, but this is what I have. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. This is what God tells Joshua. For him, for him to be successful, this is what Joshua must do. Study this book of the law continually. Then he says, meditate on it day and night. Let me say that again. Meditate on it day and night so that you'll be sure to obey all that is written in it. It's about meditating on the word, but also obeying that word. I think right here, God is giving Joshua a recipe for success. Come on, somebody. God is giving Joshua a recipe for success. He says, I want you to follow this word, but I also want you to obey the word. And then he continues, he says, only then will you succeed. I command you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. What a promise. What a powerful promise. What did God tell Joshua for him to be successful? He says, Joshua, for you to be successful, this is what I want you to do. You must meditate on the word day and night. Let me explain a little bit about this word meditation. When God says, I want you to meditate on the word. God gave me a revelation of what he was talking about. Because sometimes we miss it. We think meditating on the word, what does it mean to meditate? Maybe we see a whole kinds of meditation where we, we, people sit, fold their, their legs, raise their, their hands. Hello? Mm. Mm. As you, you are meditating, that's what it means. is to close your mind and, and get some sense of whatever is happening. This is what meditation means. It's the process of deliberately focusing on specific thoughts in relation to the word of God. Let me say it again. The process of meditating on the word. When God says to Joshua, meditate on this word day and night. What God was saying is, deliberately focus on specific thoughts in relation to what I'm telling you about my word, about the promises that I'm giving you. Now, let me give you an illustration. In biological terms, there are certain mammals that, we, that they fall under the category that we call their ruminants. They, they're ruminants because they, they chew their cord. They are like cattle. You've got sheep, goats, antelope, even giraffes. And their relatives, they fall under that category. These are four, they have what we call a four-chambered stomach. Or four compartments in their stomach. A human being only got one. Hello? If you got four, four stomach, you fall under that category. <laughs> but if you are human, you only got one. And now I'm using this illustration to, to, to show you something. Because the animals that chew their cord have got four stomach. 
When you go to the field, you see these animals, they continuously cut grass. They continuously cut and cut and cut and they put in the first chamber, the first compartment. Their whole day are spent on cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting and putting. When they relax, sometimes they will do a process of regurgitation. They regurgitate, it means they vomit. Not really a nice word, isn't it? But they, re they regurgitate, they vomit that. And they bring it back and they start to chew. The reason why they are called ruminants is because of the process of regurgitation. They are able to bring back that grass and they begin to masticate that grass and they begin to chew it. They, they are called ruminants. As I wrote down here that that word ruminants is a, a Latin word, ruminari. It means to chew over and over. To chew over and over. When God speaks of you and me, meditating on the word, what he's saying is like these animals who have to chew the grass over and over because grass is made of cellulose, the constituents of cellulose. And you have to chew over and over to, to get the eft extracts of that which is important for the animal's body to function. And so they have to chew. That is what it means to meditate on the word of God. It's not about reading five chapters a day when you get up in the morning and you read five chapters. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm an advocate of people who must read the word. I love the word. But when it comes to meditating, it is taking the word of God, processing it, masticating it, chewing it over and over until it becomes part of you. Oh, can I help somebody here this morning? That word, until you digest, you get to, you got to understand digestion for the, for the human starts in the mouth. Immediately you put food, you begin to chew the food, it's mixed with saliva, and some of the food category begins, digestion happens immediately in the mouth. Sometimes there are other food, it happens in the stomach. But for that animal, the cord, the, 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 the cattle and all of them, they have to bring back that food, take it to the next stomach, and it has to ferment. It takes time to get something out of that. Friends, to read the word of God is not a rush through. To read the word of God and to understand the word of God is not I'm doing my daily duty this morning. I get up in the morning, I've done my part, it's, it's done. No, what God is saying, take time. Sit. Analyze. Ask questions. I read this word. What, did, what was God telling me? Get your pen. Go to your Bible and write down what God was saying to you at that moment. Because you are meditating on something that God is going to use for your life. God is going to give you principles and things that are key for you to function. And so we see that meditating on the word of God is a key principle. It's a key principle and that's how God wants us. You and me must med meditate on that word until it becomes part of you and me. We become, we become one with the word and that's when the word has power. When you and I have become one with the word, it becomes power in our life. When he said the word of God is powerful and active, it's when we are using the word to do what it meant to do. So, for example, you're in a financial position. You can only give what you have. If you don't have the word of God, what are you going to give when you're in a financial position? But when you have the word, you begin to speak the word that says, Bye. Hello? That God will take me. I will go through challenges. I will go through all kinds of issues. But God is there with me. He's going to take care of me. It doesn't matter how things are happening right now. My God will supply all my need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. He is my provider. I'm not looking at the economy of the world. I know where my, my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord. It is because you have the word of God in you. And so that word is becoming alive. When you are going through a marriage situation, a crisis in the family, if you are praying for someone's healing, you begin to speak the word of God. By his stripes I'm healed. My God, he is the one who has borne my illness and took my infirmities on himself. By his stripes I am healed. You quote the word because you have the word of God in you. Friends, you can only give what you have. And if you don't have the word, there is nothing that will guide you during the times of hardship. And so I encourage you today, when you go and you are, you are spending time in the word, it's not just about to rush but say to God, what do you want me? As I'm reading this morning, what is it that I'm getting? The second thing, and the second way that God guides us is through his compelling spirit. The Holy Spirit. When you came to Jesus Christ and you made Jesus Christ your Lord and your Savior, when you say, Lord Jesus, forgive my sins, I invite you to come into my heart. I love you. I thank you for 
giving me new life, you open your heart to Christ. And you open the door for the Holy Spirit to come and dwell in your heart. The Holy Spirit is not given permission. He comes and he lives in you and he lives in me and he abides in us. God himself is now residing in your heart and in my heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is why it's so important for us to be born again. When you are born again, it's like this. It's like a light switch is turned on. A light switch suddenly turns on. We can complain if we have, we are here in this room and there's electricity running around in the cables or whatever is happening here. But we can decide we are not going to turn the switch on. We will be in darkness. But when you make the decision and you decide and you go and turn the switch on, suddenly you have light. Suddenly there is light. And so that's what happens when you open your heart to Christ. He comes in and the light begins to shine and the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in you and helps you to live life. It is the Spirit of God himself that comes and lives in us. See what he says in Psalms 143 verse 10. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. The Spirit of God will lead us, will take us to places as we set in our hearts a desire to succeed. And Jesus himself, he made a promise to the disciples in John chapter 14, verse 27. This is what he says. He said, but when the Father sends the counselor as my representative, and by the counselor I mean the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything, and he will remind you of everything. I myself have told you this. This is Jesus speaking to the disciples about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that leads us to understand Give us knowledge about Christ, about God, and about the world. We, we have an understanding, and it brings the revelation knowledge. What we need is the revelation from the word, so that when we read the word, it comes alive. It is that spirit that opens grounds for us to be able to understand fully what God is saying in, his, in the Bible. Without the spirit of God, everything that we do will be in the flesh. And friends, the flesh doesn't gain, we, we gain nothing from the flesh. It is the spirit that gives life. The flesh, the flesh doesn't give life. In fact, the flesh is weak and the flesh is carnal. But the spirit is life. In the beginning, the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 1 that God created everything in the beginning. But God, the spirit, was hovering over the waters. The word and the spirit, when they come together, they bring life. The spirit was hovering over the waters. There was darkness. And the spirit was waiting for the word. These two work in unison. Without the spirit, if you just word, it's not good enough. Without the word, with, with the word, without the spirit, it's not good enough. Both of them work together. And that's why it says, as the spirit was hovering, God spoke the word. And when God spoke the word, bah, there was life. And there was light. And so when we take the word of God and the spirit of God that is the illumination in our spirit, suddenly there are things that we've read for years. We never saw them. We never saw it that way. Suddenly, a revelation comes and says, oh, wow, I never saw it like that. It's because the spirit of God brings that light and brings that life to the word. And concerning the role of the Holy Spirit to bring truth, Jesus, Jesus, this is what Jesus says. Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 12, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he is, and he will tell you what is yet to come. That is the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is our teacher. He brings revelation knowledge. He brings knowledge about the Father. Because the Spirit and the Father are one. Jesus and the Spirit are one. Jesus and the Father are one. There's unism. There's no disagreement. First Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 11, for whom among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. They are one. They are in unison. If God speaks, the spirit speaks. Nobody knows the spirit of God except God's own spirit. He says, we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, and that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught by 
us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truth in spiritual words. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So without the Spirit of God, everything that we do, Everything that we understand is because of the Spirit of God. It brings carnality. If we walk in the flesh, we will never understand God. That's why a lot of people don't understand the cross. Because you can never descend the cross with a normal human mind. You need the Spirit of God. And so what God is speaking to us and telling us this morning is that we associate and have an understanding of the Holy Spirit. Because he's the one that helps us and brings God's revelation knowledge. So if you are not driven by the Spirit, if you walk in the carnality, in the flesh, you will never understand the principles of God. It is the Spirit that gives the mind of Christ to you and me. It's the Spirit that tells of who Jesus Christ is. So we have to be attentive, friends, to the Spirit of God so that he is able to guide us. He's able to instruct us. He speaks to us in our, in our innermost being, the decisions that we make. He tells us and even warns us of things that are supposed to come. We see with Paul the Apostle in Acts chapter 20 verse 22. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardship are facing me. Friends, what is Paul talking about? Paul knew what he was dealing with. He was, he was being warned by the Holy Spirit, the consequences, the outcome. Friend, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be tough. As you're going to minister in your ministry, going around ministering, it's going to be tough times. The Spirit was warning Paul about what is going to happen. And so this morning, I want us to understand something. We need to go and diagnose. We need to diagnose a problem in order for us to get a solution. You need to diagnose a problem for you to get a prescribed solution. And the Holy Spirit will always help us, take us to show us certain things so that when we pray, we pray according to God's plan. He reveals certain things to us. Paul says the Holy Spirit wants him about the things that were awaiting him, the eventuality. The Holy Spirit is not something. You know, in your quiet way, the still small voice of the Holy Spirit will speak to us. You got up in the morning and you are on your way to work. The Holy Spirit speaks to you and he says, don't use that road. But you say, no, but I, I always use this road. I'm familiar with this road. I like this road. But then an hour later on, you, you caught in traffic, heavy traffic. And then you say, mm, something told me. It's not something. It's the Holy Spirit. Because he speaks to us in that way. He guides us that, that way. We just need to be attentive and pay attention. One day, I, was, I, was, I finished preaching here in Branson. And I was driving to Cosmo City about quite earlier sometime this year. And as I was driving into Cosmo City, I looked up and I saw the clouds were moving. But there was this particular area that was a bit dark. And I looked into the cloud and I wondered. And the Spirit of God said to me, Samuel, you need to understand today that you are dealing with the Spirit in Cosmo City. And I said, God, what do you mean? God, what do you mean? And then the Holy Spirit said to me something quite amazing. The Holy Spirit said that there is an undermining spirit. There is an undermining spirit that is trying to undermine everything that you are doing in Cosmos City. And I asked God, I said, God, what do you mean? I went to look for the, the meaning of the word undermine. Let me read this to you. I wrote it down. Undermine means to lessen the effectiveness, the power, or the ability of something gradually. You might be at work and there are people who are trying to undermine you. What they are trying to do is make you become ineffective. Reduce the power of what you are and who you are and the things that you do. So an undermining spirit is a very dangerous spirit. And friends, I can share with you some very hairy stuff that has happened to us in Cosmos City. I used to get up in the mornings. Our staff knows many of the people around that I'm speaking here. You know what we've gone through. Sometimes early in the morning, the people in the community will get up in the morning. They will carry their trash and come and throw it at our entrance to block us from getting into the church. An undermining spirit. The Holy Spirit said there is an undermining spirit here in the community that is trying to undermine everything that you are doing. 
So we need to understand there are certain things that God wants to reveal to us. Why? So that we are able to pray effectively. Oh, come on. Somebody help me here. In your family, in your life, there are certain things that God wants to reveal to you so that you go to the root and begin to deal with that. You know, one morning, we came to the church, and like I told you, there's quite a, a, a few stories I can tell you. We came to the church, and everybody, the congregation was asked, and I was asking the question, why are we not inside? And they said, Pastor, something happened. The Sangomas in the community sat together and came to our church. They did a sacrifice. They killed animals. We saw the head of a chicken. They cut the head of a chicken, and they sprinkled blood on the altar. And everybody was afraid. When I walked in, I said, well, praise the Lord. The blood of Jesus Christ is powerful. The blood of Jesus Christ is powerful. The blood of Jesus Christ is powerful than the blood of goats and lambs. And I kicked the head of that chicken so far. We began to pray strategically. God, anything that undermines us here in the community will bring it down. No weapon formed against us will ever prosper. Anything that raises itself against God, we begin to come against that. I came here this morning to tell you, by God's goodness, last week Friday, we received the occupation certificate to move into our building in Cosmo City. Hey! Hallelujah! God say, I am building my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So it doesn't matter what you are going through, friends. You need the, we need the Holy Spirit to speak to us, for us to be attentive so we can hear the voice of the Spirit of God that is leading us so we can pray effectively and see things happening. And so we want to thank Pastor Chris and Lisa, our community in Cosmo City. Last, uh, uh, on the 1st of December, we had World AIDS Day. We were on the newspaper, the community newspaper. God is doing amazing things. He is faithful. He remains faithful and he's going to remain faithful. And thank you also for your support, for your prayers, for your encouragement, for your giving, for standing on, be, on behalf of the congregation. And I know here in, here in our church in Branston, we continuously stand for our community centers. And I thank you for that on behalf of our other pastors. Let's give the Lord a big hand of applause. The third thing that I want to share with you this morning, God guides us through his people, through the counsel of the saints. Look at the person next to you say, God is going to use you. He uses people like you and me. He speaks to us through people, ordinary people like you and me. You cannot live a Christian life alone. God never intended us to be a Rambo in the bush. Never. Rambo was a very lonely man, I must say. He wants us to be in community. That's why we have the connect groups. That's why we talk about community. That life is shared together in community. It's when you get together, you meet people who will stand with you. People who can pray for you. People who can encourage you when you're going through hard times. People who say, you know what? Don't give up yet. God is still doing something. You also need people who are loving, who understand the word, who are going to give you the right counsel. People who are not going to be yes men. People who will tell you the truth in love. Who will tell you when you err, when you make a mistake, say this is not the right thing for you to do. You got to understand this is what the word of God says. So as a community, we need each other and that's how God designs it. God wants you to guide others and he wants others to as well bring guidance to us. I must say that I thank God for our senior pastor. Because in my life, as a pastor here in this ministry, I have seen how he's guided us. He said certain things. You might not, you might not think this, this, this is important, but when he's giving us those pearls of wisdom, this is what God is speaking through him to lead us and to guide us as a church. And it comes from the head. And when he says, this is what God is speaking to me about, we come together in unity. Guess what? God commands a blessing. And so, as a community, we need to work together. God never designed that guidance to come from outside. It is going to come from inside. We can take the counsel of the world. We need the counsel of other people, other believers who are in the house of God, who are in the church. Look at what it says in Colossians chapter 3. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace. 
and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. That's what he's talking about. This passage of scripture is very clear that God uses other Christians to influence our life. Hebrews 10.23 says this, Think of ways to encourage one another, to add bursts of love and good deeds. And let us not neglect our, our meeting together as some people do, but encourage and warn each other, especially now that the day of his coming, of his coming back again is drawing near. Jesus is going to return, friends. We need to come together, pray together, fellowship together, share with each other like the old church used to do, that even in times of desperation, even in times when the nation is, in, is going through certain things, we need to come together, pray, and say, God, we thank you. We are called by God as a mandate. We are going to continue to pray for the nation. And we stand together. And so how will you know when God is speaking through his spirit to a friend or somebody in your life that you love and care? Because sometimes people make mistakes and they interpret things wrong. But this is what John says. He guides us on certain things that we should look out for. That we must test the spirit. First is what the person sharing with you. Is that scriptural? Does that line up with the word of God? Does it strengthen? Does it encourage? Does it bring comfort? And does it promote love? If it promotes hatred, maybe it's not from God. But if it's promoting love and bringing togetherness and all that, that's what God is all about. Do you feel a sense of God's peace when somebody gives you that kind of counsel? Because there must be peace. Paul says this in Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. So when somebody speaks to us, counsels us, and that's why I like our counseling ministry because we are there to stand for each other. This team of men and women who, when you're going through an issue, you come and, and they use the scriptures and counsel you and bring order into our lives. It's so important, friends. Let us not ignore those things because that's the way that God guides us. Don't think that there will be a light bulb as you are driving one, one Sunday morning. It's a light bulb and there God writing something on the skies for you. He uses ordinary people like you and me, friends. That's how God guides us. And finally, the many other ways, but I chose these four. The fourth one is that God guides us through circumstances. Oh, circumstances. How many of us have gone through issues? We've seen doors open. We've seen doors close. We've, 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 we've seen things happening around us that we ask questions. God, but where, why does this have to happen to me? Those circumstances is another way that God uses to speak to us. God will do the impossible to get our attention. That is part and parcel of God speaking to us to bring guidance. To close off with a story, in, in Judges chapter 6, a young man called Gideon, the children of Israel, the Israelites have been persecuted by the Midianites for, because of their own disobedience. They've walked away from God and, they, and they're worshipping idols. And yet circumstances have turned around. They used to be a nation of blessing. But guess what? Their circumstances doesn't look like God is on their side. Because they, the Midianites, and, uh, they will come and destroy their crops and, and ruin their lives. They were starving. These were people of God. And they had no food. There was nothing for them. Because they would destroy their cattle, their crops, everything. Scotch earth policy. And yet the children of Israel began to cry to God. And God raised up a man called Gideon. And God says to Gideon, Gideon, I am with you. My hand is upon you. I'm going to use you to bring back salvation to the children of Israel. You I'm going to use to bring a blessing back to the people. But Gideon didn't have confidence. Gideon says, God, I want a sign. Anybody ever come to God and say, God, I want a sign? God, I need you to show me that there is what I'm talking about here. There is a way out of this. Gideon wanted a sign, and God showed him a sign. Gideon says to God, God, I want to go out tomorrow morning. I'm putting this blanket tomorrow morning. I want this blanket to be wet, and I want the ground to be dry. If I come and I find that the, this blanket is wet and, and, and the ground is dry, I know God, you are saying something. You're giving me a sign. And then he comes the next morning. He sees the blanket is wet, the ground is dry. Then God says, oh, Gideon says, oh, God, please don't punish me. I just want to try again one more time. When I come back tomorrow, God, let this blanket 
be wet. And let this ground be dry. The opposite. And that's exactly what God did. God showed Gideon, I am with you. I want you to take the army. I want you to go. Victory is guaranteed. Friends, each and every single one of us is going to go through certain circumstances that we wonder. God, is God there? We want a sign. We're checking. We're wondering. If God is there, why is it happening to me? God has always got a plan. And that plan is to trust in him. Look at what it says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. It's about trusting God. When you've done everything possible in your own human ability, God says, I want you to trust me. You've tried it, but let me tell you, if you have faith and trust in me, I will bring you through. God is a faithful God. He's a wonderful God. He wants us to walk in his guidance. He is not wanting us to walk in the opposite direction. When we follow his principles, when we follow what he's saying, he's not trying to give us punishment. He's trying to say, I want you to go through the process that I have for you. Isaiah 58 verse 11. The Lord will guide you continually. Watering your life when you are dry. And keeping you healthy too. You will be like a well-watered garden. Like an like an ever-flowing spring. Turn to the person next to you. Say, you're a well-watered garden. You're a well-watered garden. That's what God is saying as we are coming to the end of this year. And sometimes it doesn't feel like that. Sometimes we feel dry. Sometimes we feel empty. But God says, listen, listen. I will guide you continually. I will walk with you. I will keep you healthy. I will... I will make sure that you flow like the springs of living water. I don't know about you this morning, friends. My message is simple. It's like a compass that we have to follow. And God wants us to get to the destination. He uses these four things that we just mentioned to bring guidance to us, to take us to that destination. You might not have arrived there yet. I don't know. Nobody has. But as we continue to walk with God, as we continue to walk with him, through the power of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, through friends and family and other people around us and the circumstances that we face daily, God continues to guide us. I want every head bow, every eye closed. Maybe you came here this morning and as I'm speaking to you, the Word of God is alive inside you and the Spirit of God is prompting you and is speaking to you to receive Jesus today as Lord and Savior. If you are here and you've never made Jesus Christ Lord, I want to pray with you. Just, just, just open your heart and pray this prayer. The Bible says you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. Say, Father God, I come to you today in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe with all my heart that Jesus went to the cross and died for my sins. I receive Jesus today as my personal Lord and Savior. Lord, come into my heart, forgive my sins, and make me into the person that you've always wanted me to be. I thank you for my salvation. I am born again. I'm a child of God. And I live today with peace in my heart. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a big hand of applause, friends. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just come this morning again. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for speaking to us and encouraging us. I pray for every family that is represented here, that you brought this morning. Let the peace of God that surpasses all knowledge, all understanding, guard their hearts and their minds. Lord, in times of trouble, in times when we are concerned, when we are worried, Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you are the one who comes close to and become a friend that is closer to us. Even during this season of Christmas, that some people might feel isolated, they might feel alone. I pray, Lord, that you draw closer to them. Send your arms around them and be with them and give them peace. So we bless this day. We thank you for your goodness to us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And now may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May God be gracious unto you as you live this morning. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's children said, Amen.